Got a cartoon, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, I know you're all busy, so I'll give you a little flavor about what we're going to talk about over the next sort of 30 minutes or so, and, and try and make sure it's worth your while. So the this is basically a talk about Horizon Europe, what it is, how to get started, how to find out information, and how to, by the end of it you should have a good idea about whether this is something for you and uh, even the kind of projects you might want to be involved in that European Union are um, you know, have forthcoming later in 2024. Um, so I'll get right into it. It'll probably be about 25 minutes talk, 20 minutes, and then we've got time for just an open Q&A about everything. So by the end of 20, 25 minutes, you should have a good idea about Horizon Europe. And then if there's any sort of follow-up or further chats around particular projects or what to get next or more in-depth stuff, I'm happy to do follow-ups with anyone or any particular groups. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Hopefully you can uh, see that OK. Um, OK, what is Horizon Europe? Uh, Horizon Europe is basically the big part of money that the EU use for research. Um, it's around 97 billion euros, um, and that's over a six year period from 2021 to 2027. And New Zealand actually bought into this project or pot of money of this program of works halfway through. So in sort of mid 2023, we had a trade agreement and, and this was part of it. And, and, it, and it was partly um, a result of the, the green paper on the research and innovation system in New Zealand, which recommended more internationalization. And so we bought into this massive program, the first non-EU country who's bought into it. Um, and, and probably the easiest way to think about it is a bit like the science challenges. They're very interdisciplinary. They're, they're, they're very much around impact. And uh, just to give you a flavor about how big the scale of the budget um, the Marsden budget last year was $83 million, and this has a budget of, of $53 billion. So it's orders of magnitude bigger. Um, and, and just also for context, Ireland, I was saying they're, they're a comparator country, um, similar size, similar structure to parts of their economy. And, and they've, in, in the last three and a half years, they've received $900 million dollars worth of funding. Um, so yeah, that's something for us to aspire to. So the way it works is that every project has to be part of a multinational consortium of a minimum of three countries, of which New Zealand would be one. Uh, so you could have anywhere from you know, nine to three countries. And so New Zealand would almost be a case study where you would have maybe people from GNS or other research institutions, you might partner up um, with other research institutions on New Zealand or even um, uh, regional councils or even people in the energy sector or something like that to try and present yourself as a, a New Zealand consortia to join the other country consortia. Um, we can join and lead immediately and the projects are probably comparison is more like the endeavour size. Um, so you're looking at 7 million to 27 million New Zealand dollars. Um, of course, that has to be spread amongst everyone. Um, and Pacific Islands can also um, join and be funded as a, a separate country. So there's something unique about the structure of it is that it has to be multinational for each program. And so part of the challenge is assembling this consortium. The other interesting thing I, I wanted to flag at the side is how it sees innovation. It uses this sort of thermometer uh, sort of gadget, which is uh, technology readiness levels. So anything um, which is blue sky is TRL1, and anything which is commercialization is right at the top. So every project has an indicative technology readiness level. So you might start at technology readiness level three and be expected to finish in five years time at six or seven. And part of the challenge of putting the bid together would be to show 
how you might do that. So that's something that's quite different than, than what we used to in the terminology. Um, so I'm a national contact point. There's six or there's seven of us in New Zealand. So part of the background to Horizon Europe is that the EU sort of political arm has got together and decided six political goals of the EU and they are health, culture, creativity and inclusive society, civil security for society, digital and, and climate and food and so on. Now the way it's put these together is around political goals which are a little bit like the way that the science challenges were put together and so this is what they're inviting research to be done on and so each one of those clusters there's six has a national contact point and you have to have one in each country when you join so there's a network of 26 or 27 other people like me in and around Europe who might represent Germany or the Netherlands or Ireland or, or whoever and, and our job is to basically try and make it a, a success for New Zealand researchers. So we're not allowed to, to bid for the, the funds ourselves and our clusters. But what we're trying to do is to raise awareness in New Zealand that this is a, a potentially good thing for some research groups to maybe help you with even bid writing or putting it together or assembling the consortium or matchmaking with European projects. And, and, and also going to Europe and trying to um, represent New Zealand research and to try and encourage them to reach out to us and involve us in, in projects too. So we're a little bit like the research office that you might be familiar with, but also a bit around trying to put consulting together and just generally be helpful and respond to what you need. Um, and you don't have to use us at all. You might have your own European contracts and put your own bids in, but with their if you need us. Um, so just as a background, I've had three European grants, including a uh, part lead in Horizon Europe grant. Um, so I've got a bit of experience around putting the proposals together and, and the kind of things which they're looking for. But I'll go into a bit more about that in a few slides. So this is where to start. Um, EU funding is not curiosity driven, really. It's more like RFPs or requests for proposals. So what's happened is that before this was launched in 2021, all the countries got together and decided what do we need to do to achieve these political goals around, in, in cluster five, it's help Europe achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And it basically came up with 200 separate Endeavour projects would be a, a good way of thinking about it. Each funded, that might be the equivalent of 10 uh, million New Zealand dollars, and each one would be uh, released throughout the, the program and for funding. So under cluster five, which is climate, energy, and mobility, there are just under 200 separate calls, um, which look a little bit like you've got on the screen. Some are closed, so we've because we joined halfway through, we've missed some of them. Uh, some are open right now and some are forthcoming. And it's the forthcoming ones which are probably most interesting because you need a bit of time to sort of build up and, and get involved. I think the other thing to sort of reflect on is I think climate, energy, and mobility is just a, a good phrase to think about for a minute. So what the EU have done have decided to hit our climate goals, we need to look at energy production and mobility. And so they've put them together in one grand challenge and that's why it's climate energy and mobility and so they're they're packaging research in in sort of natural packages which can help achieve the political goals it's not something we necessarily do in new zealand so because you're all in front of your your screens now uh, one thing you can do um, immediately is just google eu horizon europe funding portal and you'll, you'll end up on a screen which is a little bit like the one on, on your right. Um, and this is where you start really, because the difficulty is finding out what they're funding when, what's been and gone in all the thousands of uh, requests for proposals they've got. So you do that by navigating to the funded and tenders portal, and then just searching by keyword, uh, keyword or filtering um, by 
cluster or what's open and what isn't. I've I've put on these the links on the slides, which I'm happy to circulate afterwards, because there's also there's the big cluster five list of 200 projects on that PDF link at the top, which is 540 pages. Um, some have been a gone and, and some are yet to come, but it's actually really useful because you get some great ideas for your next smart idea or endeavor, even if you're not going to get involved in Horizon Europe because some of the projects look really cool. Um, so if you're on the portal and you're trying to, um, to navigate, it ends up looking a little bit like this. So you're, um, I've just filtered that. I did that this morning, so this is uh, some live projects. I filtered by Horizon Europe as a funding uh, aspect because they have various programs that aren't Horizon Europe. And then, because um, I know the audience is GNS, so I've actually um, filtered around disaster resilience which is probably more cluster three than cluster five, but um, I'm happy to talk about that as well because I'm, I'm sort of familiar with uh, that kind of thing. So if you go on the portal, try and filter and have a play around, you'll end up with a list of calls. Um, and this is basically your, your gateway to just getting started with Horizon Europe. So if you can do that, and now I'm going to um, click on the open topic. So open topics, they're pretty rare, but they're much more open and curiosity driven than the previous calls, which are very, very specific. But this one opens on the 27th of June and the deadline for proposals is the 21st of November this year. So I thought it might be useful just to show you something that's forthcoming. So you could maybe get excited and, and see if it's something for you. Um, so when you click on the link, you get, um, it's just a very short sort of web portal, probably about the equivalent of a two pager and, and how we might understand research. And it tells you um, the budget. The budget for this one is um, 5 million euros. And it tells you how many projects it's gonna fund, which is one. So they're just gonna fund the best um, one out of the ones that get submitted. And then if you sort of scroll your screen down, it looks a bit like this. So this is how directed it is. It tells you the outcomes for each call that it expects to um, achieve. And this is not just maybe the New Zealand partners, this is everyone. So by the end of the, uh, the project, you will have achieved the following. And then if you scroll down a bit further, it tells you a little bit more specifically about exactly what it wants. So I find this really, I've, well, I found this really useful as somebody writes proposals and, and, and bids because it tells you exactly what they're looking for. It gives you the keywords. It even gives you uh, really insights into the kind of impacts and for whom that it's looking for by the end of it, which then allows you to think about, well, what partners do we need to get involved and what capabilities do we need to develop? So it's actually very, very directed. Um, and, and because it's seen to achieve these political goals. So just have a play around with the portal and just get used to um, the idea of filtering by sort of open or forthcoming and you'll have an idea about what's in train and what could be a possible project uh, for you or your project team to, to explore and, and maybe try and reach out to contacts in Europe to, to get involved with. I should say we can lead these bids in the same way that we can lead a New Zealand bid. Um, it's just a bit more work as leading bids often is. Um, but there's scope with some, I don't know, maybe recycling unsuccessful previous proposals could be recycled within here as well. So this is another way that you can think about um, doing more with those ideas that haven't yet found their home. The other difficulty we're finding is that like I said, you can either lead a project, in which case you will be inundated with probably people who are quite keen to be involved in Europe, or you can try and get involved in an existing uh, consortium or consortium that's being put together. We're still working how, how best to do this and trying to think what's successful. Each project page has that 
um, aspect that I've circled on the screen, which is a partner search announcement. And so you can add um, yourself to that. So it, um, the, the only constraint is it should be really done on an institutional basis. So they don't want thousands of individuals getting involved, but say if there's someone at GNS who's keen to this, then you could communicate to the research office at GNS and ask if they could post something on behalf of the institution. And you don't get a lot of room. It looks a little bit like the other two screenshots. So there's, yeah, I think University of, of Tartu is in Finland and they're advertising their expertise in the hope that someone's gonna pick them and invite them to a consortium. So we've done this with a few things so far. So we're not quite sure how effective it is, uh, but that's the official way by which uh, people try and network. Um, there's also you know, our own ways of, of networking. Uh, we've got quite an international workforce in New Zealand um, and we write with a lot of international collaborations and partners as well. Um, the other thing which I think is, well, there's two things which are really interesting. The one, the first one is you can actually register as an expert on the same funding portal. You can click on it and it's the equivalent of being an MB assessor, uh, Mars and assessor, or just being on the pool of reviewers. So you can do that. It's very simple and straightforward. Um, so the, the idea is you might get sent proposals to review and the process of reviewing will really upskill you into what good might look like for your own proposals. So there's a, I think in particular, new entrants are arising, you could get quite a lot out of that. I think the second thing that's interesting is that it's good for PBRF full stop because you are an international reviewer of international projects and it's um, so it can provide benefit in that way. So recommending people might uh, register on that website as a, a reviewer, as an expert, and that might help us in the long run. The other thing to look at, and, and this is really interesting, it, it's a website called Cardis. I've put the website on the screen, but you could just Google Cordis EU. Cordis is the big repository of everything the EU has funded and the very sort of quick outcomes and um, dissemination activity that's maybe videos or, or podcasts or targeted outreach so that each project will be expected to produce ways of communicating and disseminating the science and then that gets captured by Cordis. So this is really good uh, for a few reasons. So you can just go on Cordis and you can type in your particular keyword your cert you're keen on and you get to see who's working in your area in Europe that you might want to reach out to. You also get to see what European funding councils have funded in your research area which is just a great way to generate ideas for your next proposal anyway. And you also get to see how they communicate science. And, and if I'm looking through some of those already, it's quite, it, it's, there's some real innovation that you could bring and put in your next research proposal, even if it's not a Horizon Europe proposal. Um, each Horizon Europe tends to have a work package around dissemination and outreach and impact. And so some of their thinking is quite advanced. They, for example, they have nine impact pathways that each proposal should explain how they're going to hit. So you've got the, you know, the traditional ones we're, we're familiar with, the, you know, the, the academic papers, but there's also different ones around societal policy impacts. And so may it, the way that they do impact is um, a little bit different than what we've done it so far in New Zealand. Um, just a, a couple of slides left now, and then we'll sort of open up. I've got into some stats on the success rate, just to give you an idea about whether it's worth your time. Um, success rate from Marsden is around 13%, Endeavour's around 16, um, cluster five, which is the one that the meetings I've been attending, has a success rate of 21%, so 50% more than Marsden. It looks like the difficulty is getting involved, and then once you're involved and you get a consulting together, there's quite a good hit rate. And, and that does differ between parts of the, um, the research program, which might have more or less 
sort of people put in bids together. So climate science had a 30% uh, success rate, for example. Just some other stats to flag. Um, average consulting time uh, size was about five countries and 15 participants. And um, they had quite a high proportion of participants who were industry or small and medium sized enterprises. And I think it's that pathway to impact sort of encourages that kind of uh, partnerships. And uh, almost half of the bids were co coordinated by research centers. So it leads me to think there's a real value in expertise. And once you know how to do it, you then invest in doing it again and again, and you might actually get a bigger share of the pie. Um, some stats on how have we done so far in New Zealand. So uh, these are about sort of yeah, about a month old, these stats, but this shows you the kind of activity we've had so far. We've had seven successful Horizon Europe projects. We haven't led any yet. Uh, we've got a number uh, through to the next round. I think it's actually up from 42 to 67 projects from last week. So um, I'm not going to updated slide yet, but there's around 67 proposals in. Um, a lot still being determined and uh, a few have been unsuccessful, but our success rate so far, and admittedly this is quite a small sample size, but we're on 30%. Um, so we've got quite a good hit rate once we're, we get in, and, and we don't quite know why. We don't know whether it's just a small sample size, or there's anything about the novelty of New Zealand, which is influencing reviewers, or whether maybe we're actually quite good at writing research proposals, which could be it. We've got quite a competitive sort of domestic uh, process, which might have held our skills. So we've had fun then in every cluster so far. Just a final slide. MB has a mailing list about Horizon Europe, so you can just click on that, put in your details to receive updates. I think the other thing to uh, mention is we've got some soundings over which other countries on the verge of joining. So New Zealand was the first non-EU country to join as if we were an EU country. Uh, and Canada is just um, going through the same process. And later this year, Canada should be in a similar position to New Zealand. And I hear that South Korea um, might be the next cap off the rank. Um, think about how you might reach out to partners in Europe, whether it's just an email to people you work with saying, hey, we can we can partner on Horizon Europe projects now. I've seen this is coming up. Is there any interest? Um, and we're trying to work out how to do that as a country as well, whether we send delegations to try and represent New Zealand science on what we got at, or whether there's something we can do to try and enable the sector to do that more effectively. So I'm going to end there and then we can just open up for any questions. I'm, I've just got a couple of slides. I'm just going to, the one that, that I'm going to just send through and these can be shared. This is interesting because it's how they assess proposals. There's just three aspects and you get scored out of a sort of five each. Um, and you need to get above a certain quality threshold on all three. Um, and there's a domestic top ups um, scheme, which I don't necessarily need to go into unless there's any questions, but basically it should be a similar kind of overhead and funding system that what we're familiar with is the end result. And uh, these is just uh, just of interest. These are the nine impact pathways that the EU um, has for projects to deliver on. And this is, I find it interesting because it shows you the nature of the consortium. You might want to assemble, might be slightly different than um, some that we might put in, in some of our other programs so far. Okay, um, I'm going to stop sharing that and then hopefully we can um, just have a, a general chat. I don't know whether there's conversations in the chat or how we're going to field the questions, but um, feel free to put the questions in the chat and I'll just try and go through them. In terms of consortia, do all consortia partners um, need to have joined similar to New Zealand? No, uh, but they, um, 
you can join any anyone from any country can join an EU project. They just don't receive the money. <laughs> is a simple way to put it. Um, so we're eligible to receive all the money, and and so the consortium partners, um, everyone within New Zealand is eligible to receive all the money from Horizon Europe. Same with the Pacific nations, um, and so yeah, we're, it's just like a normal research program for us in New Zealand. If you're looking to get international partners, it depends what the country are, because some have different relationships with EU. Um, so there might be different eligibility criteria, which I won't be able to go into until I know there's a, you know, the country in, in question. A uh, question from Kirsty. Uh, did the NCP's go go to the EU research days this year and was there any intel from that? So we've not gone to any yet. Um, and it's partly because we don't get a lot of notice that they're happening. And then we did get notice and um, it was um, a bit short notice. And so our main effort this year has been to try and disseminate to New Zealand. And I think next year we might be trying to do a little bit more outreach from EU to represent New Zealand, like White Pink New Zealand. But the intel that we're getting is that there's a lot of, well, I think the first of all, there's a low awareness that we've joined. So I've been speaking to a few research groups in Europe to try and match make and do that kind of thing. And that I think most of them didn't know that New Zealand was an option. So there's definitely an awareness raising piece. Um, and the second one is there's time zones. So they record all the meetings and they start at about sort of 10 at night. So we've been joining some of those. And it's been um, no, it's quite interesting, but we've not been there in person yet. But we're just gathering intel about what we can do that makes us successful. So, I mean, the talk to GNS is a, a really good one because we're really, really good at things around disaster resilience. The number of perils that we are subjected to in Aotearoa and the um, you know our earthquake knowledge, landslips, tsunami, all those kinds of things would be a real value to um, to Europe. Same, we have our access to Antarctic research, for example. And, and so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of things we think we can offer. And there's the, the science from New Zealand uh, from Europe is that when they know that you're uh, that we're an option, they're very excited. And it could be um, I think bids with New Zealand could be quite strong in the short term, at least. Um, we also have advantages just around there's disadvantages around time zones, of course, but it also means we can have meetings in summer when it's their winter or we have double growing seasons, for example, if we're going to do crop uh, testing or things like that. So there's advantages that we're going to try and package together to make the case for New Zealand. Uh, next question from Duo Lee. A uh, seismologist, I'm wondering when an earthquake related call starts. So there, um, there's earthquake, well there's disaster resilience, and I've not checked for earthquake as a, a keyword, but there might be out already. So the advice is to navigate to the EU Horizon Europe funded and tenders portal, I think. There's, it might be earlier in the, the chat. Um, yeah, it is, it's in the early chat. So get that up on your screen and just search by keyword and then you can see if there's anything forthcoming open now or been and gone so that's where you start with any keyword search actually that's that's probably your number one thing to do so even if you do nothing after this um chat just spend half an hour playing around with the portal and you'll just get an idea whether it's worthwhile spending more of your time doing this uh, advice opportunity multinational indigenous collaborations. Next question. I think there's a big opportunity. The indigenous um, focus we have in Aotearoa and Motoranga Māori has been seen as a real positive in Horizon Europe. When this um, when this was signed and, and put through the, the European Parliament, it was actually introduced, someone spoke in Tereo, and um, it, the thing is the first time that Tereo has been spoken in an international parliament by a non-New Zealand citizen or non-native uh, uh, non speaker. So 
there's a real opportunity for us to engage in that because we are quite advanced in that. There are indigenous research in Europe. So you've got the Sami peoples around northern Scandinavia, for example. Um, and so there's definitely, and, and also if Canada come on board as well. So there's definitely opportunities for us to show quite a different way of looking at research that could be really good in a multinational consortium where Sanji each country is trying to look at the similar problem and maybe different pathways to get towards the outcomes that you're trying to deliver. Uh, question related to Pacific Island Partners, which uh, have already joined our eligible. So the Pacific Island Partners were always able to join Horizon Europe. And it's partly because of their developing sort of country status from an economic perspective. So um, the issue is they didn't often do it because it was difficult and there's poor sort of networks connected with sort of Europe and the Pacific rather than say uh, us in the Pacific. So one of the um, one of the things which I think Europe are really interested in is using uh, us as a bridge to the Pacific and that Asia Pacific region and the sort of wider sort of geopolitics regarding that. Um, so yeah, uh, they can join and but they could join before it, but it seemed that we can now help make that happen more frequently. Um, I don't know who have already joined or eligible to fund that. I, I don't know if the, the stats on that, but I know there's definitely some. Um, you said that New Zealand's the first non-EU country to be admitted. What is the difference between associated countries such as the UK nor Israel, Israel which are non-EU, but can be included in projects? Um, yeah, so you've got the EU nations, which can all uh, bid for Horizon Europe money. And I think it's really, and you know, if you're trying to manage 26 different countries, um, it's really you see, you see why they set it up this way, because they want to use the money as almost structural economic funds to help disseminate science across the, the union and to try and make sure that um, they're looking at how to achieve political goals within quite diverse geographical context and political contracts and cultural context. So that's, once you sort of understand that background, it makes sense why you need a minimum of three countries and why they're looking at rolling out similar research in different countries because that's part of the political project of the EU. Now, once you've got those core, you've also got some associated countries. So we have a distinct funding model, which only we have, which is the way it works is that we've agreed to, to, to ensure that we're not drawing from the existing pot, we've agreed to fund our researchers what they win. So this is fiscally neutral from, uh, for the EU. So if you win a million dollars, that money comes from the New Zealand government, even though it might be paid by Horizon Europe, um, New Zealand government gets an invoice uh, for what we, we fund. Um, the UK have got things slightly differently. They've bought into it. I think they've given two billion pounds and they might be very successful or underspend on that, but they've um, that's their financial model. So each country might have its own model about how it buys in and, then, and, and also which bit of Horizon Europe it buys in. So I don't wanna get too complicated, but there's three pillars and we've bought into pillar two, which is basically the big research pot. Pillar ones, things like Marie Curie fellowships or things which enable researcher exchange. We we haven't bought into that. We've just bought into pillar two, but there's a chance we might buy into future pillars. Um, so the different nation states each might have a different associated country status. Um, but from our perspective, we're, we're going in as if uh, we've got full rights to lead and be involved across all the pillar two projects. Um, and I, I think as a general rule, anyone from any country can be involved, but only some can be funded. And that depends on the country that you're from or based in. So you're, you're, you're correct, Robert. 
Uh, next question. I assume the proposal outcomes have to focus on application in Europe. As you said, local data can be used from a case study perspective. What sort of role does New Zealand Consultancy play in these proposals? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So when you read the expected outcomes, it will be expected to um, help achieve the European Green Deal. And we've not signed up to the European Green Deal. So how does that leave us? So we asked um, our partners in Brussels this question and their steer is just swap that for your own domestic policy. Um, and the idea is that across the wider consortia, that will be achieved by the European partners um, anyway, if you might work with people in Germany or France or whatever, who are uh, looking at that application impact in Europe, but they know that we're not based in Europe and our policy regimes are different. And so I think the idea is uh, talking about even if it's not the specific you know, policy or legislation that they're referring to, to show how we understand processes of change, the uh, application of science to policy, for example, and all those kind of wider transferable aspects where it doesn't quite matter which country and it's still going to be as valuable for the project as a whole. But I do think New Zealand has a particular advantage around access to data, for example. So we are about five million people. We've got really good networks between uh, the research community. We've got good networks and access to data. We because we do this quite a lot, we've got you know, we, we can access data from local authorities, regional councils or, or other aspects, insurance councils. So I think this scale of New Zealand gives us a real advantage to be able to assemble a consortia that's quite impactful. Um, so I, I don't know whether I can say usually what sort of role does we play in these proposals other than we add to the whole and when we're not expected to deliver the entire thing, but we're meant to just add to it. Um, okay, next question. Do you know of any New Zealand research providers that are planning to lead a consortium application? Has that happened yet? Uh, yes, I do. Um, there are two being, um, uh, I think Emmy have been informed that there's two researchers looking to lead a consortium. Um, and it's not happened, well, it's not happened yet, but it's in train, so it's not been submitted. The advice that we've been given, we've been asking around just how long would it take to put a consortium together and what, you know, and it's it's almost like three months for the consortium and two months for the project. And in the world, it's, this can take quite a long time to get together. And, and so that's one of the challenges I, lay, I think for um, assembling the consortium is, unless you've got some quite good networks out there and you know who you want to work with, um, it's a bit of extra paperwork to lead in. There's, um, you know, anyone who leads projects knows that it's more difficult than, than not. Um, and this is still quite new for your research supports uh, systems in place. And, and so we're, we're working through how we can support that to happen. But the challenge we're getting is getting other people to pick us for their projects. And so obviously the way around that is by trying to lead it. And even if it's not successful, you've got the networks in place for the following bid. Um, next question, where can New Zealand organisations get support ensuring compliance, particularly the financial record keeping space? Um, yeah, so other countries have legal um, NCPs, so people who do what I do, but they're lawyers. Uh, we haven't had the funding to get that yet. And so we're, um, work in this too. I think if you're leading a proposal, it's much more erroneous than not. So with the funding proposals so far, we've had a few um, sort of grant preparation agreements that have been signed. And there's something which was an initial um, aspect that tripped people up was we each consortium to receive funding from the European Union needed a gender equality plan that was publicly available on our website. And you could put a link to it in the proposal. And we had that information on all our websites for all our institutions somewhere, but how is that to get in the right package and format to link to it to an EU bid? So there's a few things like that, some wrinkles we've been working through about how to make sure that we set up to make it uh, less friction. Uh, but yeah, the support is either from your research office 
Um, and I know a lot of the institutions are talking to each other and we're working this through on our own or MB. But basically, if you need any support, drop me or anyone else of the other NCPs aligned and we'll just we'll try and work out what you need and try and get that to you. Um, next question, uh, calling conversations with others we follow for NSCs and Canadian links. Yeah, we're going to get the the plug's going to be pulled on the design strategies soon, so this could be really good timing for what next for some of those consortia. Um, Canada will probably be part of it in the second half of this year would be my best guess. And I think um, Canada with the indigenous sort of context as well would be would be a really interesting partner for some of our indigenous researchers um, in ways that maybe the EU haven't engaged with so far because um, it, it's a different cultural context over there. OK, a search on biochar pulls from the needs for results. How would you search this sublist? OK, you'll probably need to, there's a filter box, which is forthcoming, closed and open. Uh, find that, and if you click it on open and forthcoming, it will probably go down to about 10% of that, or maybe less. If that's not the thing, you've you've searched EU wide rather than Horizon Europe, I suspect, because there's multiple programs which they can access through this funding portal. So hopefully that works for you. Uh, is Switzerland an EU country for the fund? They're currently going through a particular. They've got an interesting relationship with the EU, but I think they're going through a process where they can do what we are. I'm not sure the status of that, um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure about that one. It's probably best check, but I can follow that up and, and get back to you. Can commercial organizations, companies participate? Absolutely. That's part of the thing about a consortium. And, and the way this differs from our national research is that there's a lot more private sector involvement and they might not even be built in for any money. They might just be built in because they want access to the findings as a partner. And so they might be just a supportive partner, letters of support, that kind of thing. They don't receive the funding, but they're just going to be involved in thinking about that translation of, of knowledge to practice and commercialization. So, yeah, commercial organizations, companies participate is a positive thing and it's, it's pretty much expected with depending on the nature of the proposal. Uh, yes, and it's out is funded on the EU too, uh, if a, an NNZ based SME. So, yeah, I think the other thing is that if you're a company, you do receive the money differently. Um, I think you get 70% rather than the full 100% overheads because it's seen as an offset for you, from your sort of investment in sort of R&D. So it's almost like a, you get much, it's heavily subsidized R&D will be a different way to put it. Uh, rather than full uh, subsidised R&D. Uh, can you please clarify the funding model New Zealand signed for? Um, OK, so this is quite a. I'll just take a step back because this is really important for GNS and, and other CRIs. Um, the way that our research and, and science sector is structured in, in New Zealand is unusual internationally. We have a, a high proportion of overheads on our research projects, which in effect subsidizes the OPEX of organizations rather than is you know, entirely captured by the research. And so we use um, our overheads to fund our institutions. EU said we don't do it that way. We have a maximum of 30% overheads and uh, that we tend to do. And so that was our first challenge as a country was how do we then do a workaround in a quick way because we wanted it to be quite uh, rapid to get people involved as soon as possible. And so MB basically got some money together, new money into uh, research. This is not allocated from another research pot, it's from a, a separate part of government. And they use this to create what they call the top up scheme. So the EU will give 30% in the same way as if we're part of, um, you know, their standard 
system in Europe and the government will basically top that up to what would be our standard level. The, so, so that's the system we've got at the moment. Whether that will remain in place over the long term, it might be that we get a longer term solution, but it was quite a, a good idea to do a quick win. The, um, the, the way that's structured is that you can, it's only in the same way that overheads are, it's only applies to certain parts of the budget. So when you're putting a budget together, you would think what that might be. And there's a maximum of 1 million and I think 1 million and 50 thousand dollars per project overheads. So that's basically the upper threshold. And then we put that on just to try and make the money spread further around. So of the seven projects we've got so far, no one's even got close to that. And it partly might be because we've had no leaders at the moment. But um, so the issue around uh, sort of the one million cap, if you like, is just um, it shouldn't be a factor. But if it is, then um, it's probably how the, the research is structured. Um, and so you could maybe shift things around your research headings, as we might do with our proposals anyway, to try and then hit that cap. But we've not had anyone close to the 1 million cap yet. And so um, can you please clarify the funding model? If one of our organizations gets 1 million, then the New Zealand government pays 1 million to you. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much how it works. Um, and there's a budget which was set aside in the last government, which this government has carried on with. Uh, which is a three uh, pot of money, which we're just gradually drawing down from, which shows um, no sign of running out. And if you know, we've had a conversation, what happens if we're really successful and we use all the money? Well, I think that's just a great problem to then give back to government and say, look, we're really good at internationalization of research. Um, and so they found some money just to get it started. We don't quite know whether it's the right amount or enough or too much or too little but we're monitoring it as we go and um basically i want to give the government a big point by being super successful and showing them how great our researchers are how much do we have to pay the eu to be eligible um we just pay as we go so we've got a pot of money we're drawing down from which has been put aside um and then in future budget rounds for mb they're going to basically pick a new figure once we have a better idea of how much we spend in. All right, I think I've worked through most of the questions. Um, this is any more, I'll put them in, but in the meantime, I'll just I'll just tie up by saying um, I think it's a really it's a really interesting new opportunity for us. It might not be for everyone. Uh, but it's worth spending a few hours just having to play around with the portal or having to play around with Cordis and having to see whether, yeah, I mean, just getting those research ideas are really is not a bad use of time, even if you never put a funding proposal together for Europe. Um, and then if it is something you're quite keen on and you see something forthcoming, then just start putting the word out to the international contacts. And if you are keen, uh, and it's saying close to five, let me know and I can maybe help sort of reach out or, or to try and sort of match make and so on. Um, but yeah, what I think what would be really good if you see something forthcoming and just think, well, maybe in the next few years, maybe not now because I'm tied down with all this stuff because we're all busy. Um, but I'd really be keen to get involved in a Horizon Europe proposal in uh, 25 or 26 and give yourself a run in. Um, okay, I think that might be me. Yeah, my job is to get research money for you, so make me work for you. Just get, get in touch with ideas and um, yeah, I, I, I'm really keen for this to be a success. And, and thanks so much for joining in today. And um, yeah, feel free to keep in touch or send me an email.